الله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله وصلى الله تبارك وتعالى عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد Now in last week's lesson we were looking at verse number 25 of Surah Al-Baqarah in which Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala gives glad tidings to the believers and to those who do good deeds and Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa bashiril ladina amanu wa amilu as-salihati anna lahum jannatin tajri min tahti al-anhar that give glad tidings to those who believe and those who do good deeds that for them there will be jannah for them there will be paradise there will be gardens tajri min tahti al-anhar and beneath these gardens rivers will flow now from this particular verse of surah al-baqarah we develop so we kind of uh, derive the particular topic and the topic which we were looking at was with regards to jannah and paradise and i mentioned or we just talked about very briefly or you could say in quite detail we did talk about jannah and paradise regarding the ni'ma and the blessings which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store for us in paradise and i mentioned that paradise the reality of paradise is something which is unimaginable and the reason why is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a hadith of qudsi has said that he has ready or he has prepared something for the believers something wala aynun ra'at no eye has ever seen wala udunun sami'at no ear has ever heard of wala khatara ala qalbi bashar and he has never or he has not crossed the mind of any believer so that is something which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store for us in paradise and then from there we looked at some of the distinctive features of paradise that paradise has eight doors and these doors or gates are named after a particular action or a particular ibadah and depending on that particular ibadah a person does or is uh, inclined to he will enter jannah and paradise through this particular door and then we looked at some other kind of uh, blessings and jannah and then we finished off last week's lesson by looking at the hurain hurain the heavenly wives they are also a ni'ma they are also a blessing from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and i mentioned that every jannati he will receive two wives from this world and he will receive two hurai whereas a martyr a shaheed who sacrifices his life for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he will receive 72 hurai he will have 72 heavenly wives according to the hadith of sunan al-tirmidhi now from the afore going discussion there may be some who may think that in jannah we will be receiving so many things that when whatever we desire whatever we want we will get it or we will get that in jannah and paradise so there may be some of you who may be thinking that entry into paradise will be very very difficult because if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got in store for us something which is unimaginable something which we cannot comprehend that whatever type of food or drink we which we desire or which we want we will get it in paradise this is like for example i'll give you a, a modern day example it's like for example you sometimes you may uh, involve yourself in some kind of competition at school or at colleges and so on and obviously the first prize they may say okay you could have a ipod now obviously they won't tell you to or like if you like uh, write a b c d you get ipod no they may probably tell you that a proper hard challenge they'll set a very difficult challenge and if you fulfill that challenge then you will get the ipod like because obviously ipod is something which is expensive something which is quite good so obviously the challenge they're going to set is going to be something which is difficult if it's so for example like the first prize is they're going to give you i don't know like a pen or something like that then obviously the challenge is going to be very very easy so exactly same thing with regards to jannah and paradise a person may think that in paradise will be receiving this we will be receiving that then the challenge in this world is going to be very very difficult we have to be proper like religious we have to be proper righteous we have to be proper like you know have beards we have to wear like turbans we have to come for mosque for every namaz and so on then we will enter paradise however when we look in the hadith of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam we will find evidence we find examples where a person if he does little deeds if he does like small small actions 
then these deeds and these small actions is a way or is a, uh, leads that person to Jannah and leads that person to paradise. Let's have a look at an example of a hadith from Sunan al-Tirmidhi where the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa has said that whoever regularly reads these 12 rakat sunnah prayers during the day and during the night banallahu baytan fil jannah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will build a house for him in jannah and will build a house for him in paradise. And these 12 rakat sunnah everybody does and I'm sure everybody sitting in this majlis does this. It's very straightforward. Two rakat before Fajr Salah. The Sunnah Muakkada, two rakat before Fajr. Then four before Zuhur and two after Zuhur. Which, so that's six plus the two in Fajr, that is eight. Then two after Maghrib and then two after Isha. Twelve rakat throughout the day. And Rasulullah is saying that whoever regularly reads those twelve rakat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will build a house for him in Jannah. So look how, is that difficult? That is so easy. So from this we can understand that entry into Jannah is very, very easy. By doing little deeds such as this, and I'm, giving, I'm going to give you some more examples as well, a person can guarantee himself, obviously through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Jannah and paradise in the hereafter. Let's take another example of a hadith of Sahih al-Muslim, where the Prophet of Allah <coughs> sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that the inmates of paradise will be of three types, meaning that there will be three types of people who will enter Jannah or who will be in paradise. And one of them is that person who wielded authority. Basically that he was, he had authority over people. And he did insaf and he did adal, he was just, he was fair. And because of this, he will enter Jannah and he will enter paradise. So for example, just take Amir al-Mu'mineen, a leader of the believers or a leader of the Islamic State. So when he's dealing with many hundreds, thousands of people and he's fair with them, he's just with them, then by him being just and fair, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant him paradise. And it's not restricted to just, for example, leaders of Islamic State, wherever you have authority. You may be like, for example, a manager of a particular firm or a particular business and so on, and you have many uh, workers, employees working for you, uh, sorry, employers working for you, then in that situation, you have to do insaf, you have to do other. Okay, if you treat them fairly, by treating them fairly, you will enter Jannah, you will enter Paradise. You're a teacher and you have students beneath you, then again, every single student in your class, you need to treat them fairly. If you, for example, shout out a particular student, or if you give detention to a particular student because he didn't do his homework, and then the next student, he didn't do his homework, and then you let him off, then that is not insaf, that is not other. So this hadith of saying Muslim is saying that whatever you have authority, then you have to do insaf. By doing insaf and adal, then you will enter Jannah and you will enter Paradise. Take another example of a hadith of Musnad Ahmad and Sunan Ibn Majah, where the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa has said that whoever builds a mosque for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it's equivalent to a bird's nest, meaning something very small, a small mosque, doesn't have to be like a big mosque like this particular mosque here, but just like a small house or what they now, nowadays call as a musalla, like a small room or a garage, he just opens a mosque there so people could come and read the mosque. So if he opens a mosque for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or builds a mosque for Allah, even if it's equivalent to a bird's nest, again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will build for him a house in Jannah, will build for him a house in paradise. So again, by just donating for a mosque, Something very small, one pound, two pound, five pound, then again, you will be guaranteed Jannah, you will be guaranteed paradise through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take another example of another hadith of Sunan ibn Majah, where the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa has said that whoever cleans the masajid, whoever cleans any dirt from the mosque, then again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant him uh, paradise and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will build for him a house in Jannah, will build for him a house in paradise. So have you seen again, something small, Okay, just like building, uh, like, you know, cleaning the dirt from a particular mosque and so on. Like for Eid, a lot of brothers, they help out, like, you know, cleaning the mosque and so on. So again, by just doing that, a person will be guaranteed Jannah, will be guaranteed paradise. Take another example where the Rasulullah has said that when a person, when he doesn't quarrel, he doesn't, like, have a fight with anyone, he doesn't argue with people, even though he may be on hot, even though he may be right, again, the hadith of Abu Dawood says that I guarantee a house in the surroundings of paradise 
for a man who avoids quarreling even if he were in the right. Meaning that even if he was on haq, even though he, if he was on right, then again he didn't quarrel, he didn't argue with someone, then again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guaranteed jannah for this particular person. And there's many examples when you open hadith books like Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, or even if you open Fazail Amala, Fazal Shaykh al Hadith, Mulana Muhammad Zakariya, Rahmatullah, again you'll find little, little deeds, you know, guaranteeing you jannah and guaranteeing you paradise. So from this we can see that entry into paradise is something which is very easy. Obviously the condition is that you have to be a believer, which we're going to look at later, but this entry into paradise by doing small, small deeds is something which is very simple and something which is very easy. Now the last topic which we're going to look at with regards to paradise is <coughs> who will enter Jannah and who will enter paradise. <coughs> now it is the belief of Ahle Sunnah wal Jama'ah that the disbelievers, they won't enter paradise at all. Okay, those who didn't believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who say like for example didn't believe in the finality of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or didn't believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at all, then these people would not enter Jannah, these people would not enter Paradise. And it is also the belief of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah that all Muslims will eventually enter Paradise. All believers will eventually enter Paradise. Even though I mentioned this last week that even though there may be some sinful Muslims, so at the beginning they may enter Jahannam. Again, this is all down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to the will of Allah. These people may enter Jahannam and the fire of hell first, so initially, and after they have expiated for their sin, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, take them out of Jahannam and out of the fire of hell and put them into Jannah and put them into paradise. So that is the belief of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah that no disbelievers will enter paradise and all believers, all Muslims will eventually enter paradise and will eventually enter Jannah. Now there's, other, there's two more topics which we need to look at very briefly. That is number one, what will happen to the children of the believers and number two, what will happen to the children of the disbelievers. That, just say for example a child, age of three, four, five, passed away and this child's parents are both Muslim. So what will happen to this child? Would he enter Jannah? Would he enter Paradise as well? Or what would happen to him? Because obviously he hasn't reached the age of puberty. So obviously Hisab and Kitab, i.e. like uh, being questioned about your deeds and so on, happens when you reach age of puberty and then whatever actions you do, then you are responsible for your actions. But this child at the age of three, four, five, six, before he reached the age of puberty, he passed away. So what would happen to this child? Now with regards to the children of the believers, it is more or less a unanimous view or verdict of all the ulamas and all the scholars, and that is that all the children or the children of believers who passed away in their young age, they will enter Jannah, they will enter Paradise. Okay, so a child, age of three, four, and so on, he may have passed away, and his parents are both Muslims, then this child will enter Jannah and this child will enter Paradise. The second topic here, or the second question is that what would happen to the children of the disbelievers? That the parents, they were both Christians or they were, I don't know, like Jews or Hindus, Sikhs, it doesn't matter, but their offspring or their children, before they reached the age of puberty at the age of four, five, six, they passed away. So what would happen to the children of the disbelievers. Now with regards to this particular issue, there are four views or there are four opinions. The first opinion is that the children of the disbelievers will also enter Jannah, will also enter Paradise as well. And this is substantiated from a hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari narrated by Sayyiduna Abu Hurairah al-Anhu that the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said that every child is born on fitra. That every child is born recognizing, realizing that there is a oneness or there is like only one God, that there is only one Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So every child is born in the state of fitra. And then after that, depending on his parents, if his parents, is a, if his parents are Jews, then they will make this child a Jew. If his parents are Christians, then they will make 
this child a Christian, if they are Hindus, then they will make him a Hindu and so on and so forth. So keeping this particular hadith in mind, some scholars have said that because they were born on Fitrah and they passed away before they could be held accountable for their actions, so the first opinion is that even the children of the disbelievers, they will also enter Jannah and they will also enter Paradise. And furthermore, there's another hadith of Muslim the Ahmad, narrated by Khansa bint Muawiyah, who narrates from a paternal aunt that she asked Rasulullah sallam that who would be in Jannah, that who would be in Paradise. So Rasulullah replied by saying that the prophets are in Paradise. The older Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam, they are in paradise. The martyrs are in paradise and the newborn children or newborn babies are in paradise. So here the word newborn babies, it's in Islamic terminology, it's known as mutlaq, meaning that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasalam hasn't said, oh, it's only Muslim newborn babies, he just said newborn babies. So from this we can derive and determine that even uh, Muslim offspring who passed away at their young age, at their young age and similarly, children of the disbelievers, before they reached the age of puberty, they passed away. They would also enter Jannah and they will also enter Paradise as well. So that is the first opinion with regard to the children of the disbelievers. The second opinion with regard to the children of the disbelievers is that they will be made the servants of the Jannah. I, those people who are in Jannah and in Paradise, these people will be made the servants of those people. And this is mentioned in a hadith of Musnad Abu Ya'la where Rasulullah has said that the children of the mushrikeen are the servants of the people of paradise. That the children of the mushrikeen are the children of the disbelievers. They will be made the servants of the people of paradise. So the second opinion is that these, uh, the children of the disbelievers, they will be made the servants of paradise. The third opinion of Ibn Bayhaqi rahmatullah and that is that the children of the disbelievers they will be uh, uh, that it will be down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or it is down to the discretion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you could phrase it in that way that it is down to the discretion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meaning that whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to do with them whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides with them then he will do that so on the day of judgment if he, because obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows taqdeer, knows what's going to happen and so on. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his infinite wisdom knew that this person when he would have grown up, he would have probably become a disbeliever, then this person, this child may or will enter the fire of Allah. Or if, for example, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that this person will be a Muslim or he will become a Muslim, then again, uh, this person will enter Jannah, will enter paradise. So that is the third opinion. And that is that they will be left to the discretion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last opinion or the fourth opinion, and this is the opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi in his Majmul Fatawa, he has written that these children, they will be tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test them on the day of judgment. How will the test be? Wallahu a'lam only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test these children of the disbelievers on the day of judgment. And if, for example, if they demonstrated or if they showed some signs of tawheed or some signs of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then these people will enter Jannah. If they showed any other signs besides this, then they will enter Jahannam. And this is the view of Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmatullahi. So that kind of concludes our topic on paradise. If we look ahead, uh, or if we go forward on verse number 25, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, Kullama ruziku minha min samarati rizqa. That every time they are given a fruit, a fruit to eat, qalu haza lazi ruzikna min qab. Then the people of paradise will say that this is what we have been given before. Now, now from this particular verse 25, as I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has touched on the topic of paradise. So he's mentioned that the believers and obviously those who did, who did good deeds, they will enter this place or this Jannah, this garden beneath which will rivers will flow. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say that Kullama ruziku minha min That every time the people of Jannah and Paradise, they will be given a fruit to eat, then the people of Jannah will say, Hazal lazi ruziqna min 
that this is what we have been given before. Now what is meant by this particular uh, answer that we have been given this before? The scholars have said that the fruits which the people of Paradise and Jannah will receive will be similar to the fruits in this world. So like for example you've got apples, so the people of Jannah and Paradise they'll be given an apple as well. So once they see this apple, or when they see this apple, they will say, oh, we've already got this, we've already tried this in this world, we've already tried this in, uh, in this dunya and in this world. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, wa utubihi mutashabiha, that they are given something which resembles each other. Mutashabiha means that they are given something which resembles each other, meaning that the taste of that apple in Jannah in Paradise will be totally different than the taste of the apple in this world. Okay? Even though the shape will be exactly the same, even though like a pear or a banana, it look exactly the same, and you may think to yourself, oh, we've already tried this, we know how it feels like, we want something new. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, look, the shape of it is the same. That is resembling each other, however the taste and the, uh, the context of what is inside that will be totally different than what you have tried and tasted in this world. So that is the meaning of this particular verse. The kullama ruziku minha min samati rizqa. They will reply by saying, "Has a lazi ruzikna min kabda." We've already been given this. It's like sometimes, like you see some kind of dish and you say, "Oh, we've already tried this before," and you, and you look at it like, "Oh, I don't want to eat this anymore." But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is replying by saying, "No, even though it may look the same, even though the shape and everything may be exactly the same, however, the taste and the context of that particular food will be totally different than what you have tasted in this world." Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, وَلَهُمْ فِيهَا أَزْوَاجٌ مُطَحَّرَةٌ That for these people in paradise, there will be azwaj. That there will be wives who will be purified. And obviously we touched on this topic of Hura'een last week, that they will receive these wives, these Hura'een, these heavenly wives, who as I mentioned in the hadith of, uh, I think the Sahih Bukhari or Sayyid Muslim, but anyway, that these wives will be such that no person or no other person has ever seen. Okay, it's like they will be just made and they have been made created just for you. As mentioned in the verse of Surah Al-Rahman, لَمْ يَتُمِثْهُنَّ إِنْسٌ قَبْلَهُمْ وَلَا جَانٍ That no ins, i.e. no humans and no jinnat have ever touched them. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that there will be these wives ready for you who will be purified. وَهُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ And the people of Jannah will remain in Jannah for eternal. Like they will remain in Jannah forever and ever. The word Khalidun means that forever and ever. And when you look at it, that is like a blessing in a way as well. Okay? Whenever you go somewhere like a trip, say you're going to Dubai or something like that, then you know you like this trip so much that you don't want it to end. But the thing about this world is that every good thing comes to an end. Like after a couple of weeks of vacation, that's it. Your trip is over, your holiday is over, now you have to go back to work, now you have to go back to school. But with regards to Jannah, you will get all the blessings, whatever food, you know, you could do anything in Jannah. You will have everything in Jannah and Paradise. But when you look at it, the greatest blessing is that it is forever. There's no ending. It's not like for one year and that's it, you have to, you know, leave this place. No, you'll be there forever and ever and ever. And when you look at it, that is also a, a form of a ni'mah and that is also a form of a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you probably heard of the hadith of Sunan al before, where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has said, that on the day of judgment, after those people, they have been uh, given their abode, meaning that the people of Jannah have been told that you could enter Jannah, you, you are going to enter paradise, and the people of hell have been told that you will enter Jahannam and the fire of hell, then what will happen is that a ram will be brought forward. And this ram will be placed between paradise and between hell, so that the people of paradise can see this ram, and similarly the dwellers of the fire of hell can also see this ram. And then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will order this ram to be slaughtered, indicating that from now there will be no death. There will be no death, that's it, there's no death. And it comes in the hadith of Sunan al that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is saying that if there was still death, then the people of Jannah will die to happiness. That they will be so happy that they will die. That is like indicating that how happy they will be, that if there was still death still possible, then the people of Jannah will die through happiness. 
and the people of Jahannam, while seeing that death has finished, that they're not going to die anymore, they would die due to the sorrow and the grief. So that is like an, another blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that the blessings of Jannah is forever and ever and there will be no ending point, there will be no like kind of time when a time will come where a person will be removed from Jannah, a person is in Jannah forever and ever and ever. Now the next verse, verse number 26, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَسْتَحْيِي أَنْ يَضْرِبَ مَثَلًا مَا بَعُوضَةً فَمَا فَوْقَهَا that verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He's not ashamed to use the example Ayyadriba masalam That he's not ashamed Yastahi means he's not ashamed Ayyadriba masalam To use as an example Ba'udatan ma ba'udatan fa ma fawqaha Something as a fly or something bigger than that Fa ma fawqaha Something equivalent to a fly or something bigger than that Okay, now this verse number 26 of Surah Al-Baqarah is linked with verse number 23 of Surah Al-Baqarah. And if you remember in verse number 23, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ When the disbelievers, they had a kind of objection, they had doubts of whether the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in fact, or whether in reality, whether it is the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or whether it is the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or of some other person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he laid down a gauntlet, he laid down a challenge and he said, فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِ That if you think that it's not the words of Allah and if you think it's the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or you think it's the words of some kind of magician or someone else, then you try bringing a verse of the Holy Quran, you try bringing a chapter of the Holy Quran. So obviously we looked at this tafsir in, more, uh, in quite detail before. So this verse here, inna Allah la yastahi, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not ashamed to use a fly or something small like a spider or anything like that as an example. Now to understand this particular verse, I will just give you an example of like a modern day example. Just say for example, if a person who's a very successful businessman and he's earning just say around 200 grand, 300 grand a year or just say more than that, then when he talks, then his like, level of speech is going to be of a higher class, meaning that when he talks in terms of money, he's going to use examples of thousands. He's not going to use examples of like five pound notes or ten pound notes and so on. When he talks about cars, he's not going to talk about a Nissan Micro, he's not going to talk about like a Toyota or anything like that. He'll talk about Mercedes, he'll talk about Ferraris, he'll talk about BMWs and so on. When he talks about vacation, when he talks about going for holidays, he's not going to talk about, I'll go like, I don't know, uh, London for a holiday or go, you know, somewhere like that. But he'll talk about, I'll go Dubai, I'll go Australia, I'll go America, I'll go South Africa, I'll go, uh, I don't know, all these you know, nice fancy places. That's what he's going to talk about. Now one of the objections which the disbelievers had was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so great. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is this you know, great being, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. Then why is it that in the Holy Quran we find examples where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses things such as ants, spiders as similes? Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to describe people or to describe disbelievers, he uses similes such as ants and cobwebs and so on. So again, the disbelievers, they had this kind of objection that said that this God, he's so great, so when he uses examples, he should use, you know, examples which are, uh, I should say, which are, uh, which um, are similar to his majesty and to his greatness, not examples of like ants and spiders and so on and so forth. And in particular, the objection they had was of a verse of Surah Al-Ankabut, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ تَقَذُوا مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَوْلِيَاءَ كَمَثَلِ الْعَنْكَبُوتِ Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the belief of the disbelievers are those who make someone besides Allah a god, their belief is like a spider. كَمَثَلِ الْعَنْكَبُوتِ اِتَّخَذَتْ بَيْتَ who has made a house. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say, وَإِنَّ أَوْحَنَ الْبُيُوتِ لَبَيْتُ الْعَنْكَبُوتِ And verily, the houses, or, well you won't use the word house, but you could use the cobweb of a spider is 
very very weak or the weakest of all houses is the house of a spider with the cobweb of a spider now I'll just explain this particular verse in more detail animals of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are a creation of Allah and when we look at animals they live in different different places you've got like for example a lion who probably lives in a den you've got birds they live uh, in a nest somewhere uh, on a tree then you've got like for example burrows or holes where probably rats and scorpions live and so on and then you've got a cobweb where spiders live now out of all those houses then burrows and nests the weakest out of all of them is a cobweb because a cobweb just by a slight breeze can easily dismantle a cobweb whereas a slight breeze won't dismantle a den won't dismantle a nest won't dismantle a burrow or a hole so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from this verse is saying that the weakest of all houses are or is a cobweb or is a house of a spider indicating that the belief of the disbelievers is very very weak that the belief of the disbelievers believing in a false god their belief Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying is like a spider's web where through a mild breeze or through a small breeze a light breeze then that the same way a cobweb is destroyed similarly um, their belief is destroyed so the disbelievers they had this objection and said that why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using words such as you know cobwebs spiders and you know and so on in the Holy Quran so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is replying by saying that inna Allah la yistahi that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not ashamed to use examples of a fly or something bigger something smaller than that okay that it's like for example if you are a khalid if you are the creator if you are the owner of something then you can do whatever you want to do so that is exactly the same as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is the creator of this world this Quran are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala however he wants to describe the beliefs of the disbelievers however he wants to describe something then he is able to do that so inshallah I'll just leave you at this particular verse there's some other topics inshallah which we'll look at next week inshallah in particular with regard to animals the topic which can be derived from here with regard to spiders and animals and inshallah we'll look at next week uh, what does Islam say regarding animals and in particular what does Islam say regarding killing spiders and insects and so on so inshallah this is a topic which we will uh, look at in more detail next week now before we finish just uh, one particular masla which we need to clarify and it's an important masla because it actually affects the validity of a person's namaz and a person's prayer now the masla is that as all of you are aware or probably know that one of the uh, prerequisites of namaz is that you have to cover your private parts it's uh, very straightforward that you have to cover your aura you have to cover your private parts and the aura or you could say the nakedness for a man in the Hanafi fiqh is from his belly button or just below his belly button up to and including his knees so that portion has to be covered whilst you read your namaz and it's one of those conditions that it's not just for the beginning of namaz it's for the whole duration of namaz so the five minutes or the ten minutes you're in namaz then that five ten minutes you have to cover that particular area now alhamdulillah many of you do but then you get some brothers like obviously they don't do it intentionally but what happens is that because of the jeans they're wearing and so on or whatever clothes they're wearing sometimes whilst they go into ruku then their backside can be seen or whilst they go into sajda then their backside can be seen and obviously it's, it's something which is difficult because what happens is that if you go and try and tell the brother that look you know your backside can be seen and like your namaz isn't done then they get offended and think oh you're trying to embarrass me and so on and then they get offended and then obviously and sometimes for an individual himself he sometimes feels a bit like shy telling someone look your backside can be seen in namaz you know try covering and so on so it's something difficult and that's why I get this question that people say oh you know what shall we do in that situation because I worry that if I go and tell him then he's going to get angry on me and then he's going to cause a big scene and then uh, and, and so on so what I'm doing is I'm just highlighting this masala in, in here in a gathering so I'm saying in a neutral in a third party way so that no one is offended what I'm going to say now as I said that it's necessary that you cover that part and the masala in the Hanafi fiqh is that if one quarter of that area is exposed then your namaz breaks 
Okay, the, well the exact Musla is that if it's exposed for the duration of three subhanallah, let's say for three seconds, then your namaz breaks. So just say for example you've gone for sajda or you've gone for ruku, and then that area is exposed. Just say you're wearing a t-shirt and that area is exposed, then if it's equivalent to one fourth, and most of the time that when you're reading namaz with like jeans and t-shirt and so on, that area does become exposed. So because it's one fourth, and obviously if it's equivalent to three subhanallah, then your namaz breaks straight away. Okay, you will have to repeat that namaz again. So just keep that in mind, like when you're reading the namaz, make sure first of all that you wear appropriate clothing to the, uh, com- when it comes to masjid and so on. I'm not saying that wearing jeans is haram, because we already looked at this particular issue before. You can wear jeans, but I'm saying that make sure you wear such clothing where obviously all your private parts and in particular that area. It's not necessarily private parts, but that area just below your uh, belly button up to the rectangle part of your private part and then obviously uh, the knees and so on, they have to be covered whilst reading the mind. If not, your namaz will not be just and it will not be valid. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the topic to accept what has been said. Wa akhiru da'wa in alhamdulillah. Inna rahmanin namun. Salaam. Inta salam. Tabarak tayyad al-jalali wa al-salam. Allahumma alina. Rabbana taqabah minna naka. Al-Mirani wa al-Tubarani. 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 Al-Mirani wa al-Tubar